Hey guys, this is John, and welcome to part three in my series on climbing the rating ladder. Today we are playing players in the 1200 to 1400 range, and we start out with a 1394 rated opponent who's played the Sicilian. Um, I like playing knight f3 followed by d4 against the Sicilian, and this is the open Sicilian. It's considered to be theoretically uh, the strongest way you can play against the Sicilian, so not a bad idea to follow this path. And white opens the middle and tries to play actively in the face of black lagging in development a little bit. So black is playing the knight orf variation. Um, you will see players at this level have more theoretical knowledge. You know, as we climb the ladder, that makes sense. People are going to pay more attention to the opening and they're going to study it in more depth. And 1394 is a serious rating. Like that indicates that the player has spent some time. They probably reflected on their own game and um, they're doing a lot of positive things with their chess. They practice a lot of good chess habits, probably. But they also still have glaring errors. So this is all theory still. I like playing f4 in this position, and I'm going to follow up with queen to f3. This is a little bit aggressive. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that you play this line blindly without knowing the theory. Um, I am going to castle queenside and see how this turns out. I'll go back and demonstrate a couple alternatives that I think you can play against this specific line. Um, to be quite honest, the Sicilian is a, a theoretical minefield, and there's no single line you can play that will just be a cure-all for the Sicilian woes, because it's a very serious opening for black. Um, every world champion has used it at one time or another. Um, most grandmasters, uh, I would venture to say 90 5% of grandmasters have probably relied on the Sicilian as their black defense to e4. Okay, my opponent plays knight bd7. So we've talked a lot about quick development, and I'm going to make a quick developing move here too. Just get our last minor piece in the game, bishop c4. So knight bd7, I believe, is supposed to be a slight inaccuracy, um, because now my knight and my bishop might be setting up for a sacrifice on e6. The better move would have been queen c7, which would have prevented the bishop coming out to c4. Okay, so now he does this, and I am going to make a sacrifice, and this is not a sacrifice I'm just doing because it looks good. I actually know it to be good, uh, based on my knowledge of this line. So I give up my bishop, and after he takes back, I'll take with my knight. At that point, I have two pawns for the piece, but I'll be attacking his queen on c7, and I'll also be hitting the pawn on g7. All right, so he declined to take the piece. Looks like he was scared off by the complications. So now I'm up a pawn. Um, I can take on d7 and try to exchange down a little bit. I can also just drop this bishop back. I'm not going to leave it on e6, although I would have a fork in the case that he does. Um, I think it's better to just bank the pawn and get on with our life here. I could also play knight f5 and attack his bishop on e7, but you know what? I'm just going to drop this bishop back to b3. So even though there was some uh, theory at the beginning of this game, we can still practice good fundamental chess concepts and try to win with our extra pawn. Uh, knight c5, so hitting the bishop, attacking the pawn on e4 a couple more times. This is a good move, I think, knight c5. Also opens up bishop g4. So... Um, Notice if I castle queenside right here, that would be overlooking one of my opponent's threats, bishop g4. Which is funny because uh, my my last video, the rating ladder video for the 1000 to 1200 rating range, got posted to Reddit, and someone actually posted a game that they had played right after watching that video, and they fell for an identical skewer, bishop g4 on a queen on f3. So I could play a prophylactic move like h3 in order to stop that, I can also eliminate this knight on f6, which solves the problem. Like, I'm thinking about bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6, knight d5, attacking the queen and the bishop on f6. That looks pretty good off the top of my head, but they do have queen a5 check at that point, which kind of disrupts my, my plan. So probably a sensible thing to do is just castle short. If I castle short and they take my bishop, I am a little concerned that after pawn takes, they might play queen c5, which would be pinning my knight on d4. So that's the only thing I'm considering right now. We do have an undefended piece. This knight on d4 is loose, so I don't want to allow my opponent to 
uh, go and attack it or somehow win it. Could move it away from the center, but that seems a little weak. You know what also might be an acceptable way to continue is take on f6, and then after he takes back, then castle queenside. I think I'm going to do that, because that gets rid of the bishop g4 idea, and by castling queenside, my rook on d1 will help defend the knight on d4. And I'll still have knight d5 as an option coming up. So after bishop takes f6, I'm not just blindly playing knight d5, because it looks like a good move, attacking the queen and the bishop. You have to consider your opponent's reply. So queen a5 check would appear if I did that. All right, so he takes, and let's continue as planned. Protecting a loose piece, always a good thing to do. So if he takes on b3, I would likely take back with my a pawn, and I'd still be looking to play knight d5. It is important to consider the implications of castling queenside. Um, usually when you have opposite side castling like this, you will have a position with mutual attacks. Black would be trying to attack me on the queen side. I would be trying to do the same to him on the king side. But I would like to still trade down, and I'm not really thinking quite yet about playing something super aggressive like g4, g5. Because usually you want to aim for a pawn storm. Um, I'm more looking to just use my pawn advantage and hopefully make the game as simple as possible. I'm ahead of pawn. I have a better pawn structure. He's got a weak pawn on d6. So queen a5, what is black threatening? He wants to bring the queen down to a1. It's debatable if that's a truly dangerous threat, because I could play, for instance, knight b1 or even king d2, although my b2 pawn is loose. But I don't want to deal with that, so I'm just going to play a defensive move, king b1, stopping king queen to a1. I'd still like to sink my knight into d5 if possible. So if you're in this rating range, 1200 to 1400, I do think it starts to make sense to pay a little bit more attention to openings. And if you're consistently finding yourself in unfamiliar territory out of the opening and your opponents are playing normal openings, uh, it is okay to crap, crack open an opening book or uh, consult a database, for instance, like the chess.com openings explorer and try to improve the lines that you play. You don't have to go crazy. I would definitely recommend that you keep your opening study to a minimum, but uh, you want lines that will be serviceable to you. You don't have to lock yourself in a room and spend hours studying reams of theory, but you want good, solid, serviceable lines that you feel comfortable playing. Okay, so queen b4, attacking the knight on d4. However, I think my opponent's overlooking the fact that I have knight d5, so I get this nice fork in, hitting the queen, hitting the bishop. He is attacking d4 twice, and I'm only defending it once, but if he wants to win that knight, he would have to lead with his queen right now, since the queen is the piece that's under attack. And I would simply take, and I'll be winning uh, a queen for a rook and a knight. I'm happy with that trade. So if this queen moves away, let's say, to c5, um, I'll probably just capture on f6. I could maybe try to chase the queen further, like something like queen c5, b4. Might... I might be able to banish the queen all the way to a7. Maybe that's not a bad option, because I do notice that if queen c5, b4, if they go to c4 with the queen, I would have b3, and I believe the queen is trapped in that line. So he backs it up to a5. Yeah, so here if pawn b4, looking to chase the queen, black can play queen d8, which would defend the bishop. So I think I'm just going to take this guy. It gives him double isolated pawns. He's not going to be happy with that situation around his king. Now his king is wide open, we can still try to play to simplify if we want, but uh, with his king being so exposed, I would like to go for an attack of some sort. So his queen is kind of defending along the fifth rank, uh, so I can't play a move like queen h5. I'm thinking about playing f5 right here to cut off the queen. I'm also thinking about trying to rook lift to try to get on the g-file. You know what might be the simplest though, is just give a check on g3, and then after king h8, play queen h4, attacking the pawn on f6. Then you'd have to play queen d8, 
a very defensive move. I could also maybe play a retreating move like knight e2, which would uncover an attack on uh, the d6 point. That might not be so bad. Yeah, I'm going to do this. So rook takes d6 as a threat. This looks odd, but I'm also looking at that d5 square as a place to put the knight in the future. So knight c3 to d5. The position is now becoming sharp, so I'm not entirely sure if knight e2 is the best move, but it looks good, and I have under a minute. I'm up a pawn. So I'm going to go with my first instinct. So several ideas behind that move. Attack d6, try to maneuver the knight in. That queen g3, queen h4 line was also looking pretty good. Yeah, so here I can just take this pawn. Queen e1 is not possible because my rook on h1 guards. I think he was naturally concerned about his king being on the g-file, a little bit exposed. So that's why he probably played king h8. He can play bishop e6 now to block rook takes f6 as a threat. Okay, so rook g8. Now, are we just going to take the pawn on f6 without thinking about it? We could, but then bishop g4 is going to appear on the board. Um, I don't know if that's a big issue. I can play queen to f2 and just defend the knight. But you know what? I think his bishop is such a bad piece. I'm just going to stop his main threat, bishop g4. And I'm going to ask him what he's going to do with this piece. Because if he puts it on e6, like I said, I can play pawn f5. Prophylactic chess like this is a very powerful thing. It shows that you understand what your opponents are up to. It often frustrates your opponents too, I've noticed. Like once you, sh you start shutting down numerous threats of theirs, um, often they'll self-destruct. I've seen this happen many times. Good players will not, but uh, at the lower end of the rating spectrum, people will sometimes become increasingly wild with their attacks when their uh, primary attacks are not succeeding. Okay, b5. I think I can just go take this pawn. It's undefended. We've stopped bishop g4. Looks like he might be trying to put the bishop on b7, perhaps. He might have decided that he can't bring the bishop out the conventional way. Now f7 is under attack. The bishop is bearing down on the e4 pawn, but we can take this and attack his bishop. Two ideas with, the, with our last move. Attack the bishop and also prepare queen h5, maybe. Although, if his bishop moves to, say, c6, queen h5 could be met by bishop takes e4, defending h7. However, I see I do have queen e5 then. So even that is very good for us. Okay, so here we have a choice. We can just pick up the bishop, or I can try to play for checkmate. Since queen h5 is met by rook to g7, um, I think I'm just going to pick up the bishop. Yeah, I don't see any danger to doing this. We're both getting a little low on time. I'm already up a ton of material. I don't have to play for checkmate right now. He has some aggressive moves he can make like that. Let's just bring our rook over for defensive c2. I hadn't moved my rook yet. Probably a good opportunity to assign it to a defensive task. And he just doesn't have much he can do. Okay, now I'm going to move in for the kill. Queen takes h7 is the threat. Yeah, and he didn't notice the checkmate. Okay, so let's go back and take a look, especially at the opening, because I do want to give some specific advice when facing the Sicilian. So I'm sticking with e4 as white at this rating level. Um, if you start to notice a, a preference for d4, you can certainly start playing that move too. Uh, but I'm just sticking with e4. And my opponent played the Sicilian. So as you rise up the rating ladder, you're going to face the Sicilian a lot more. As I said, high-rated players rely on it because it provides uh, a good, theoretically sound way to combat e4 that also provides black a lot of winning chances. Unlike e4, e5, you immediately unbalance the game when playing c5. You create an imbalance in the position. You're attacking the d4 square with a flank pawn. And there are many schools of thought about how to combat the Sicilian. Um, I would recommend just going right for the main line, which is the open Sicilian. The open Sicilian is characterized by playing knight f3 on move 2, followed usually by d4 on move 3. 
Uh, now, it, it would be impossible for us to discuss the theory, nor would I even want to, with uh, a player in this rating level, um, because it's the, the theoretical uh, uh, layout is, is a minefield, let's say. Um, you don't want to ignore the theory if you're playing knight f3 and d4, but don't feel like you have to, as I said before, lock yourself in a room and study everything there is out there before you confidently can play this. Just go ahead and play it. Just play knight f3 on move 2 and d4 to follow. And if you take some lumps and you take some losses early on with this, that's fine. Um, I just like how white develops and opens lines at the same time. So playing d4 in many people's eyes on move 3 here is a minor concession because you are offering to give up a central pawn for a wing pawn. But this has been shown to be the easiest way to get your pieces into play, and you do have a nice knight in the center on d4. Usually black will play an early knight f6 in, in this particular line, and you respond with knight c3. So here, just to give you an idea of how many lines there are possible, uh, my opponent played the knight orf, which is a6. This is one of the most reliable lines in the Sicilian, but they can also play knight c6, which is the classical Sicilian, uh, g6, with the, which is the dragon, and e6 as well is another line uh, called the Shevenigan. I know I'm pronouncing that incorrectly for... Uh, you Dutch viewers out there, but uh, I'm going to call it the Shevenigan, <laughs> e6. So, again, don't feel like you have to go overboard, but um, it's just helpful to know that this is an acceptable way to play, and you can do some research on your own. Play it in some games, look some stuff up in an opening book that you might have. Um, a really good one, by the way, is Fundamental Chess Openings, I believe by Van der Steren is the author. It's a good opening book that provides a nice overview of many lines. So play it, study a little bit, and just see what happens. Um, after a6 on move number 5 here, a good rule of thumb if you're not sure what setup to follow in the Sicilian is to play bishop to e2 and then castle short. So if you want just something that's going to give you a simple position, then bishop e2 followed by castling short is not a bad way to proceed. Um, you can put this other bishop on e3. Basically, there's a number of uh, bishop arrays that are possible. You often see these bishops going to various squares, like for the light square bishop, either e2 or c4. For the dark square bishop, either e3 or g5. And I would say the most conservative arrangement that doesn't sacrifice theoretical sound soundness is usually bishop e2 castles and bishop e3, and proceeding from there. I played bishop g5 because uh, this is a line I'm pretty well familiar with. On um, or is it move number six here? And after e6, I played f4. So this line is aggressive and is characterized with castling queenside. Some of the sharpest and best lines in the open Sicilian for white do entail castling queenside, like against the dragon variation, for instance, g6. The best plan for white is bishop e3, queen d2, and a quick castle's queenside. So even against the knight orf, uh, as I did here, I prepared castling long. So queen f3, knight bd7, and that allows this bishop c4 idea. So if you study the theory in this line, you'll you'll know that queen c7 is usually the preferred way to play in order to cover c4. So knight bd7, bishop c4, queen c7 attacking my bishop, and I took on e6. So if he had captured, I was going to take with my knight, at which point I would have two pawns, plus I'd be hitting the queen and the pawn on g7. So my opponent castled, but then I was able to bank a pawn. And I think the weakness of the d5 square is also telling. Um, kind of a theme in this one was not uh, not just playing the natural move, but which would be knight d5 here, but uh, taking a good look around and making sure you're recognizing your opponent's threats. Because if I had played knight d5, looks great attacking the queen and the bishop, but he was going to respond with queen a5 check. So hence, I castled queenside and simultaneously defended the uh, weak knight on d4 that had no prior protection. Queen a5, and, a good, and again, a prophylactic move, king b1, stopping queen a1 check. Queen b4, now we get the knight into d5. We we're patient and allowed the play to develop. Now we get this fork, took the bishop. And again, it, it might be possible for me to play in a more uh, decisive manner right around here, but I like knight e2 because it opens up the rook, and also I was thinking about sending the knight into d5. Rook takes d6, and h3, some would consider this to be excessively cautious, but I like how it recognizes the opponent's threat of bishop g4. 
and we started gathering pawns. And still paying attention to the opponent's threats. I took his bishop, but even after this, he's fighting. Queen d2. Is queen takes c2 fatal? Probably not. I mean, I could always escape with the king. Rook takes c2 might be a problem if that was allowed, because he would be ganging up on the b2 pawn. So just one more defensive move, rook c1, after which he's devoid of uh, many threats. And we were able to threaten checkmate on h7. Okay, I'm going to look for a new game. I'm glad we were able to discuss the Sicilian a little bit, because as I said, that's an opening you will face as you rise up the ladder. And my the open Sicilian would be my recommendation if you want to uh, get the most bang for your buck when playing against the Sicilian as white. On move number two, by the way, black can also play knight c6 or pawn e6. Both of those lines are common, um, as long as I'm waiting for a game here. Let me say that uh, if knight c6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, if black plays an early e5 in order to harass your knight, it's usually best to go to b5. So in doing that, you try to sink your knight into d6 if possible, and you're not losing time. Uh, for those of you who are just new to the open Sicilian, you usually do not want to take Black's knight on c6, because if you do that, they will take back with their b-pawn, and that helps them in the center. Okay, this player aborted the game. I'm going to look for a new one. Oh, and I'm climbing the rating ladder on chess.com right now, but uh, I'm thinking that in the future... Okay, he offered a rematch. Let's take that. I'm thinking in the, f in the future, if all goes well with this series, I'm going to climb the rating ladder on other sites too. So I might do Lee Chess and ICC and uh, try to get a, um, a nice cross-cut of uh, the various chess servers out there. All right, Akhilesh Raj Bahar, 13.41. Is he going to make a move? His connection seems kind of poor. All right, I'm going to abort this game because he's taking way too long. All right, we have an opponent, 1247 on Neem. Let's see what he throws at us. People are a little slow out of the gate today. <laughs> yeah, his connection is also poor. All right, let's get a new game. I'll probably be sticking with e4, e5, and d4, d5 from the black side just for consistency's, consistency's sake. And what I was explaining about uh, the Sicilian, oh, the same guy. <laughs> Does he want to play this time? All right, we got a game. So I'm going to stick with e4, e5, see how it goes. Maybe I'll mix in a Sicilian or two in this video or the next video as we continue rising up the ladder. Roy Lopez. And if you recall from last time, what we do against that is play a6. I like this move. You can also play knight f6 on move 3, but a6 is a fundamental choice. Paul Morphy's preferred move. So he backed the bishop off. Last time we had an opponent who took on c6, and if you recall, playing d takes c6 in reply is the correct thing to do there. Okay, so white castles. Um, here, black could take on e4, but that's a slightly dangerous proposition when we have our king in the center. Um, if knight takes e4, white could open the middle with d4 very quickly, and I'd have to be cautious not to get caught in a pin. So I'm just going to play bishop e7. And a rule of thumb that I described last time is that if your opponent does not defend their pawn on e4, you don't really have to defend your pawn on e5 quite yet as black. Okay, he plays c3. Here, I actually am going to take on e4. It would have been more accurate for him to play rook e1 on the previous move. 
Um, now I feel okay playing this because my king is a bit better covered. So even though he can play this move, I'm just going to back my knight off. I'm not going to play d5 and try to support it because then I'd be walking into a pin here. He could play moves like knight takes e5, for instance. But I will back my knight off. And I think we're going to have a simplification in the center because he's likely going to take and try to win his pawn back as he's doing here. Okay, let's just take him. And after rook takes, I'm going to castle and escape the pin along the e-file. Playing b5 is also probably a decent idea. Maybe b5 is better. Because if b5, I can back his bishop off and then play d6. Yeah, let's play b5. I like the look of that. It opens up this diagonal. Like, he can stick a queen on f3 and attack our rook on a8. Uh, but that's fine. Uh, we can always play rook b8 in reply to that. So let's play d6 and back the rook off. I'm lingering with my king in the center for just a moment. But the bishop on e7 is well protected. Bishop g4 could be interesting right here. Developing and hitting his queen. He'd have to play f3, which looks slightly weakening around his king. Yeah, let's do that. So I'm postponing castling, usually not a great thing to do, but um, I think under the circumstances it's all right. Hmm, maybe queen e2 is interesting. Yeah, he plays it. Hmm, okay. Now, I won't claim that I'm impervious to making mistakes. <laughs> you know, I think my last move might have been an accuracy, because now queen e2, and it's a little harder for me to castle. Because if I castle, he can take on e7. I think I perhaps should have dropped my bishop back to e6. Okay, let's just play c5. What I'm going to do is probably put my rook on a7 and protect the bishop in preparation for castling short. Yeah, I think I should have played bishop e6 if I wanted to do this whole bishop g4, induce him to play f3, and then move the bishop away. I think it would have been better to play the bishop to the uh, e6 square and block the e-file. Okay, he pushes d4. Let's take that. So now we're both going to have isolated pawns. I think rook c7, albeit an unorthodox move, is uh, fine. So defending laterally and preparing to castle. He's lagging with his queenside development a little bit, so I think I can get away with this. I would expect knight c3. Yep, he plays it. All right, so now we can successfully castle. We have e7 sufficiently protected. I don't have any grand plans right now. I'm just looking to complete my development. And um, as I pretty much just did by castling, and I'm going to wait and see how he proceeds because he's got this piece to bring out and whatever path I choose after this could be influenced by where he puts his dark square bishop. Okay, he puts it on e3. So I kind of like to see that because it does block the e-file. I have a feeling he's trying to load up for d5. Because that would be a discovered attack on my rook on a7. I could play d5 and try to block him. I think I'm going to play rook c7, though. My rook was a potential target on a7. I think putting it on the c file is useful in the future. b4 might be a threat at some stage. I could, in fact, play b4 right now b4, get his knight to move, and then maybe stick the knight on d5. This is an interesting plan. You can also play bishop g6 and just look for a trade. Yeah, let's play b4. So we'll attack the knight, and I'm going to put my knight on d5 on the next move. Yeah, knight e4. 
I won't take, because uh, I think that might strengthen his pawn structure if I do that. So we'll just come here and attack his dark square bishop. This is a nice square for our knight. If he puts the bishop on d2, for instance, looking to escape the attack, then he would just drop the c2 bishop. So he plays rook there, sensible. Now, do I bank the bishop pair or do I wait? Bishop g6 looks like a good move. My bishop's not doing anything on this diagonal anymore, so I think putting it on g6 could be a good plan. Yeah, let's do that. I like my knight on d5. I think it's well-placed, so I'm not necessarily going to take on e3 at the earliest available moment. He may play something like bishop b3 and try to force the issue. Attack my knight on d5. So far in the uh, like one and a half games I've played, uh, my opponents are playing a little closer to the vest as far as undefended pieces. Our previous opponent dropped some stuff down the stretch, but that was already in a difficult position. They did let us play bishop takes e6 at the outset. But this player is keeping most everything guarded. Okay, so here I might have something in conjunction with knight takes e3. So by moving the knight away, our bishop is attacking c2, but it is defended twice. So I could play like bishop takes c2, but they would play rook takes c2. And then after rook takes c2, queen takes c2. Uh, even though the queen would be no longer defending the bishop on e3, he does have the rook as backup. However, if I start with knight takes e3, that's kind of tricky because um, if queen takes, then I could take on c2 with the bishop. If rook takes, there might be a possibility for a bishop g5 move. Uh, moreover, d4 is very weak. So I'm going to take here and just see how he responds. He can play bishop takes g6. Might be the best move. But I could always recapture if necessary. This is getting sharp. Bishop takes g6. I could even take on c1 if I want. I could try that. Okay, he takes back. Now, this the two rooks are lined up, so bishop g5 is a potential idea right here. And let's just try to get the move order right. So if I play bishop g5 right away, he can play f4, but then I could take on f4. He takes with the queen, and then I take on c2, and I've banked a pawn. Now, before I play that, that line, I want to check the other move order, because this is a pretty good idea, it seems. So when you have a good idea, it's important to try to twist the move order around in your head, try different permutations of the move order. So what if I take on c2 first? Like let's let's say bishop takes c2, rook takes c2, and then bishop g5. I see that that is not as effective because I'm not skewering both of his rooks. The rook that was on c1 would be on c2, so he could just move that rook away. So I checked both move orders, I'm going to play bishop g5 because I think this is the stronger one. With the plan of playing after f4, just bishop takes f4. Little bit of a deflection idea. So his queen is deflected from the defense of c2. He'll only have one defender of the c2 bishop. And after queen takes f4, I could take on c2 either way. I'm going to take with my rook just in the interest of pursuing further simplifications. He's a bit more actively placed than us at the moment, uh, but I don't see him having tremendous compensation for the pawn. So let's go take that guy. He could try to bring his knight into attacking uh, into an attacking position like knight h5 or something, but I think my bishop coming back to g6 should cover a lot of squares. I'll be looking to try to get my rook in the game soon. That piece has not moved since I castled. I think bringing the bishop back makes a good deal of sense right here. I'm going to do that. It was undefended on c2. It was a loose piece. He played an unhurried move, h3, so I feel okay and also playing a move to consolidate.
king h2, also an unhurried move. So I'd like to trade trade rooks and play rook e8, but um, there's some issues with that. Like one issue is he could just trade rooks and then take my pawn on d6. So it could make sense to uh, move my queen so my rook can go to a different square, like say queen b6 and allowing rook c8. But before I do that, I'm going to play h6. This just gets rid of any potential threats to my king along the back rank in the future. So I can play rook moves with more confidence later. And I won't constantly be having to worry about rook to e8 and whatnot. Okay, rook f3. So he's lining up on f7, but I don't see a, a huge problem with that square yet for me. But just to be safe, I'm going to play queen d7. Overprotecting f7 and allowing this rook to come to one of the desired squares here. Probably e8 or c8, the two open files h4, what is our opponent trying to do? Probably h5. I think we could allow that. I could also play pawn h5 right now in order to stop that. Let's do that. He has queen g5 if he wants, but I do have queen g4 defending. So again, a, a prophylactic move, just putting a stop to the opponent's threat. Still be looking to move this rook soon. The difference is already pretty noticeable in just the overall strength of the players at uh, the 1200 to 1400 level versus like, let's say two rungs ago, players under a thousand. Uh, the games of the players under a thousand were pretty random, to be honest. Like they have difficulty at that rating level formulating plans and also playing a coherent game from start to finish. Whereas this game, aside from the my opponent dropping the pawn, has been very well played, I think, on his end. Um, you can tell that like each move is a continuation of his last move for the most part. Yeah, I'm going to go here in order to defend h5. And he's really not giving me a whole lot to work with. I mean, he's doing a good job of putting up a great fight down a pawn. The opening could have been a little bit better. As I said before, people will still make blunders at this level. I mean, just because you've reached 1200 rating doesn't make you immune to dropping pieces, but we just haven't observed that yet. Okay, so now I have doubled pawns. I think given that I just got the queens off the board, that's an acceptable trade for me. If he plays rook f4, I saw that I could play f5 and defend the pawn on g4. So let's see what he does with his rook. He's getting a little low on time. Now let's play f5 and just support the pawn. If h5, I'll play bishop h7. That way we keep our f5 pawn well guarded. It's defended by both the bishop and the rook. It's a little bit of a bummer that my rook and my bishop have to stay guarding that pawn for now. Like, I can't do other things in the meantime. And yeah, he moves the knight away. I think this could give me an opportunity to um, maybe play, like, rook e8 and attack the knight, or maybe rook c8 and go after the c2 square. Yeah, let's do that. If he plays his knight back to g3, I can always repeat with rook f8 if I'm unsure, but I'm thinking knight g3 and then maybe come into c2 anyways and try to go after his b2 and a2 pawns. Okay, king g3, I think that's kind of a weak move. Let's come in here. Our bishop is bad for now, but our rook is doing great work. Yep, and here you go, he dropped a piece. So he dropped his knight on e2. You could tell that was a product of time pressure. He's getting a little low there, and yeah, he just... Uh, let the knight go. I'm going to bring my king up a little bit. I can also play rook e5. Let's play rook e5. I think this is a sensible way to do it. He could go rook b8 check, but um, after king f7, he can't really go after my bishop because rook h8, I would have bishop g8. So I like rook e5 because that attacks the d-pawn. Yeah, and he comes right back. Now I'm going to bring up my king. 
activating your king should be a central goal of most endgames. So I'm bringing it up to f6, and I'm going to look to play my bishop to g8 and attack that pawn on d5 this way. All right, so we can take either way on d5, but I'm okay with simplification, so I'm going to do this. He is marching with his a and b pawns, but we have enough resources in the vicinity to stop that. His pawns are not far enough advanced. All right, he trades, but this is probably going to be the end for him soon. He's down way too much material. Let's take. My bishop will always control the path of his pawn. So after this, I can play my king to g5. And maybe play f4 check or gobble his h-pawn. He's down to 10 seconds now. Looks like he's going to flag. Okay. All right, so let's go back and have a brief look at that game. So this is a Roy Lopez, and again, we're playing a6. Um, if he took on c6, I would take with the d-pawn, so as to enable, after knight takes e5, queen d4, attacking the pawn and the knight. So instead, he backs the bishop up to a4, and then knight f6. So this is a little strange when you're first learning this opening, but there's kind of like mutually assured destruction going on. Like, he can't just win my e-pawn because I will win his e-pawn. If he were to take on c6 now, I would still take with the d-pawn, and in the event of knight takes e5, I would still play queen d4. Um, however, after he castles, now I have to be more concerned about his rook making an appearance on e1. I still do play bishop e7, because he has not defended his e4 pawn yet, meaning we don't have to defend e5. But if he had played rook e1, which is the main line, at this point he would be threatening to take, followed by take here. And black's usual queen d4 would not be work, working anymore. So let's say black were to castle or something. He could take on c6, take, take here. And I have difficulties getting this pawn back. If queen d4, he could play knight f3, attacking the queen. I can't win e4. It's defended by his rook. So if I go back to the game. So after bishop e7, he should play rook e1, whereupon I would have played b5, which ensures that he could not take my knight. Uh, but he played c3, and here it is fine for black to take on e4. Whereas previously, you know, you can also take on e4 in this position, but it's a little more dangerous when uh, there's nothing really blocking your king. They can play d4, and you have to be careful, because if you take this pawn, rook e1, and already you're pinned up on the knight, d4, knight takes d4, for instance, threatening f3 and also double attacking c6. But once I get my bishop to the e7 square, I feel a lot safer right there. So this move right here, bishop e7, c3, now I can take, because um, I'm one, one move away from castling at all times. So rook e1, I just dropped back. He took e5, we traded. I might have played this a little fancy. It's possible I should just castle right away and not worry about it. Uh, I was trying to play some attacking moves prior to castling. But you can see I kind of got myself in a small bind after queen e2 because now I can't castle for fear of the bishop dropping off. Probably should have played bishop e6. But um, I think my opponent misplayed the position right about right about here. I have some pressure. Knight, knight g3 seems like a weak move. Um, not a terrible move, not a game-losing move, but he does lose a pawn out of that. Um, Although maybe he could have taken on g6, because after I took here, it is possible for him to take there to um, attempt to avoid some of the problems he had in the game. So, although actually that would be interesting too. So like, let's say he takes here. Let's say I take with my h-pawn and reply, or maybe rook takes c1. Getting a little complicated here. It's something he could have calculated. I won't uh, waste more video time talking about that, but he could have tried bishop takes g6 at this juncture. Okay, I'm going to look for a new game. But yep, you're going to have to work harder at this level. People are going to be giving you less free pieces, as you saw this game. This guy put up a very good fight. Ah, McConville is our next opponent. Okay, this is uh, someone who actually follows my videos. I believe his name is James. So hello to you, James. And he's playing the Scandinavian defense. He's choosing my own opening against me. 
Will he play queen takes d5? All right, so let's play knight c3. Just attack his queen and develop. I'll play knight f3 all the same. All right, d4. I'm not doing anything too fancy. Just developing bishop c4. I'll play bishop d2 and see how he reacts. So, so far we haven't wasted uh, too much time on extraneous moves. We're just developing quickly. Uh, he shows that he's not afraid of uh, his queen being on a5. I could do discovered attacks with my knight, but instead I'm going to play queen e2. Now, if I get a chance, I'm going to try to bust open the center here. Because in the Scandinavian, even though I love this opening dearly, uh, those who don't know, I like playing this opening as black. Uh, but in the Scandinavian, black does fall behind in development because you are moving the queen a couple times at the beginning. Okay, this is a very dangerous move by him, castling. Uh, now I have options. I can try to play d5 and open the middle. That probably makes a little less sense when his king is not on e8. Or I can try to play to trap his queen. So I could play, for instance, knight d5 right now. And his queen is on the brink of being trapped. If I go knight d5, he has queen a4, but that would be his only safe square. Notice that knight d5 takes away the c7 square for him to retreat to. So let's calculate this for a moment. So knight d5, let's say queen a4, and we're like that close to, to trapping it. Uh, bishop b3, he has the b5 square he can go to though. Hmm. So maybe, maybe knight d5 is not uh, ending the game right away. <laughs> I could play knight d5, queen a4, bishop b3, queen b5, and then or, uh, and after queen b5, play c4, but he has queen a6 in that case. So he's always got like one square he can go to in defense. Okay, I spent a little time thinking about it. I don't see like a clearly good way to play, so I'm just going to castle. I think you can't get too wrapped up in your blitz and your standard games in trying to find... Uh, a win in a position where you consistently notice defensive resources for your opponent. You have to be practical and uh, try to use your time uh, adequately if you're not coming up with anything. Because I could have spent an additional minute there and maybe not found something and I would be regretting all the time I had spent. So we'll just castle. Castle short. Castling long was also a possibility, but given the way he's played the opening, I kind of like castling short. And uh, he probably should put, pull the queen back to the c7 square for protection. That way he gets out of any discovered attacks. Yeah. All right. Good move. Good move by James. All right. So we have opposite side castling now. Um, I want to start pursuing an initiative on the queen side. So let's play a4. I'm going to start pawn storming him. a5, a6. Just go after him. He's underdeveloped on the king side, so he would love to counterattack my king, but he is lagging a bit in the development department, so I feel like I'm going to have to jump on him on the queen side. Sensible moves for black would be like knight gf6 or maybe bishop d6 at this point. Plays bishop b4, okay. So this move also allows some discovered attacks, like knight b5 would attack his queen and also open up an attack on his bishop. But if knight b5, c takes b5, bishop takes b4, he can take on c4. So I don't like that. Uh, he's also kind of stopping me from playing a5. So what to do? Maybe bishop b3? With bishop b3, I'm setting up knight b5. I want to see if he notices that. Because now after knight b5, c takes b5, bishop takes b4, there's no bishop on c4 that would be hanging. He could play a5 right now. Normally when you're getting pawn stormed on one side of the board, you don't want to make uh, a pawn move or too many pawn moves over on that same wing because that tends to like bring the attack to you. Okay, so I'm going to do this now. Knight b5. And if he takes, I get to take on b4. And then the c file is opened up and we've seized the bishop pair. So I like that trade-off. 
If queen a5 right now, trying to use the queen to defend the bishop, then he's opening himself up for knight d6 check. So queen a5, knight d6 check. He's unable to take it with his bishop because his queen behind would hang. So I get a chance for knight d6, and then I can take on f7, and that should be awful for him. So he should take on b5 right now. He's giving it some thought, which is the correct thing to do. I think knight b5 kind of surprised him. Ooh, okay. So, yeah, now the problem is I'm going to get this move in. Check. And like I said, he's unable to take it because he loses his queen behind it. Now, assuming he plays, let's say, king b8, I could either take on b4 immediately or play knight takes f7. I'll probably play bishop takes b4. It just looks a, a bit more clear. Another move that's good here, by the way, is knight c4. I could play knight c4, attack his queen, and also hit the bishop. It's kind of a tough call. Do I play knight c4 and go after a full piece? Or do I play knight takes f7 and go after his rooks? Hmm. You know what? I'm going to do this. It would have been interesting to take and then ensure that I get one of his rooks for my knight too, but maybe this is the more clear-cut way to proceed. In either case, I'm winning about the same amount of material, like three points. So, yeah, he, he doesn't have a square to move his queen to that is safe that also defends the bishop. Like, b6 and b5 are covered. Uh, c5 is also covered by my pawn. a6, I can just take on b4. So he's just losing a piece. He can move his queen away, or he can take on d2, whereupon I would take his queen, and then he would take back with his bishop, and I've won a queen for two minor pieces. That's what I would do as black. I would take d2 and then go take a5 and try to fight on, but it's not going to be fun. Yeah, he dropped the queen back, and now we win the bishop. And notice we're also threatening bishop to d6 now with the pin. So I would say black's play was a little bit reckless. I mean, the implications of the queen on a5, especially with a white bishop on d2 in this opening, are a little delicate. Um, a good rule of thumb is if white is threatening knight d5 with the discovery on your queen on a5, if you're unable to play queen d8 as a defensive measure, something might be wrong. So even though I wasn't able to find a win uh, right after he castled queenside, it was very close, and that's not a position black wants to be in. All right, so knight here. Um, we can trade on b6. I can play bishop a5, which would pin him down pretty nicely. I think trading is fine. Let's just do that. Maybe queen e5 if I want to swap the queens coming up. He takes with the queen. Okay. So I could play... Bishop c5. Notice my bishop is under attack right now. So bishop c5, queen here, and then queen e5 looks pretty good. That would ensure that the queens come off the board. This is a good tempo move to attack his queen with a gain of time. So if queen e5 and he takes it, I can take either way, actually. Pawn or knight takes. And I like the clarity that this offers. We're also threatening bishop takes a7 if he doesn't take on e5 immediately. If he takes, I'll probably take with a knight because I see it's a little awkward for him to defend the f7 point. He can't put a rook on f8 because of my bishop here. So if queen takes e5, knight takes e5, he'd have to play bishop g6. And then I can look for even further simplifications if I want. Yep, he found it. Let's play c3. Just defending d4 a bit better. Now we're up a piece. The game plan is always the same. I probably sound like a broken record at this point, but trading down, um, avoiding unnecessary complications, 
and trying to reduce the imbalances in the position, not letting our opponent get some crazy imbalance, like uh, a, a material imbalance, that is, that might complicate our task. Okay, king c7. If I take on a7, it looks like a free pawn, but he can play a uh, b6 maybe to trap it. Although then I can play a5 and get the bishop out. So, in fact, this is fine to do. Sometimes, though, if you're taking a rook pawn with your bishop, you have to watch out for them trapping you by pushing their knight pawn. As happened in a very famous game, um, Spassky versus Fisher, game one of their 1972 World Championship match. Okay, let's just go a5. I like the clamp that that gives me on this square. If this knight moves, I have bishop b6 check, skewering the king to the rook. Okay, let's back this guy off. He's very low on time now. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go here. Bring our rook to a good file. Yeah, he's moving his king around a little bit. I think c4 is a decent move. Keep the pressure on him. Yeah, he is too low on time to really figure out what to do, and he's in a losing position, so he resigned. Okay, so let's take a quick look at that. I think the, the first few moves were okay for black. I won't get into the theory too much in this opening. But as I said, when you're putting your queen on a5 this early, you do have to be very cautious about the possibility of knight d5. And after he castles, his queen is deprived of the d8 retreat when I do this discovery, and that makes me very nervous for his position. So um, after queen e2, probably would have been best to play bishop b4. That way his um, he puts a buffer in between his queen and my bishop. Playing castles is really asking for it. Uh, he said good game, so I'll tell him good game back. And let's look for another game. I have time for one or maybe two more. All right, Santiago Magno, 15, 1352. Okay, let's open with e4 against him, and he's playing the French defense. Good rule of thumb, uh, if your opponent plays a pawn up one square on the first move and you played e4 as white, push d4 right away. Don't delay. Okay, so here, um, most players at lower levels, when faced with the French or the Karakhan, they will either take the pawn on d5 or push past. Because as I've explained before, lower rated players are often very uncomfortable with the concept of tension. Uh, but a middle option that I really like that you don't see very often at this level is just developing a piece and defending the e4 pawn. So... Um, you always want to err on the side of choosing openings when you're starting out, choosing openings that uh, allow for quick development. So he's playing bishop b4. This is the winnower variation. So if you want to ask yourself, what is black's threat? What's black threatening to do? And the answer is d takes e4. My knight is now pinned, so I have to address that somehow. Uh, here I am going to push the pawn to e5. So I was just talking about how uh, you may not want to close the position immediately, but in view of that threat, it is correct to play e5 here. And we're into some theory. Yep, c5, that's the theoretical move. I'm going to play a3. I feel okay playing a rook pawn move this early because it attacks his bishop. It's not like just a time-wasting pawn move. There's a clear purpose behind it. Get him to clarify what he wants to do with this bishop. So if he takes on c3, we have a damaged pawn structure slightly, but we do have the bishop pair. So a big theme for this game could be uh, the weakness of the dark squares. Okay, so c4. So this move closes the position down, which kind of makes sense from Black's point of view, because he does have the knight pair, and I have the bishop pair, so he would like to keep the position closed. Uh, however, I think the damage he's doing to his dark squares is pretty significant now. Let's play queen g4. An early queen move, but one that has a threat in mind. Queen takes g7. This is a move in the French that can often pinpoint uh, the drawback of developing the bishop to the b4 square early on. So this is kind of specific to the French winnower, but this happens quite a bit, queen g4. All right, so now look how many pawns he has on light squares. His dark squares are very weak. 
So I could immediately um, think about ways to get my bishop in, like bishop g5 is a sensible looking move. I can also play h4, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to develop. Just bring another piece into the game. Hmm, makes another pawn move. Okay. Um, yeah, let's play h4 now. This seems a little aggressive, but I want to make him think about uh, the possibility of h5 in the future. And we'll see how he treats that. I don't know that there's any specific way to punish c4 this early. It is kind of a weak move, but the position is close enough that I'm not going to be able to just assault black's position right out of the gate. His development is completely backward at the moment. He hasn't brought out any pieces. He's probably thinking about uh, where to put them, because I already am aggressively placed right now. I mean, he might be hesitant to move this knight, for instance, thinking that h6 is weak. Place knight d7. Maybe c6 would have been a better square for that piece. Okay, I'm just going to get a piece up into the game. Bishop e2. Knight b6. All right, so maybe he's headed for uh, the a4 square. I could play pawn a4 myself, maybe looking to put the bishop on a3. That's kind of an attractive option, actually. My bishop might not have a good square to develop to otherwise. The only thing about putting the pawn on a4 is that it does become a target. Like if a4, maybe he plays a5, and I could have trouble defending this pawn in the future. I'm still going to do it, though. I think getting the bishop to a3 is pretty interesting. So let's play it this way. But yeah, a5 is a possibility. He plays bishop d7. I'll advance a5. He could send the knight into a4. Yeah. So now he's attacking c3, and also the pawn on a5 is undefended. Uh, but I don't think I'm going to lose sleep about him taking that pawn. I will play bishop d2. Kind of a bummer that I can't put my bishop on the long diagonal and instead have to consign it to this one. If he takes, I think I'll just castle on the short side. He'd be in a bit of a self-pin there. Although, honestly, he could probably take the pawn and then scurry back, and uh, I would have to prove compensation. Yeah, he's going to do it. All right, so now, yeah, I can castle. H5 is also interesting, too. Try to open the position up. If H5, almost certainly he'll play uh, G5, I think. Let's throw on H5. It does weaken his king side a little bit. After G5, I'm already thinking about sacking on uh, the G5 square. That would be very interesting. But I could also just castle and play it a little more simply. So g5, let's say knight takes g5, h takes g5, take with the queen, then queen g7 is a threat. He could play knight e7 though. Looks a little unclear, I'm just going to castle. Well played by my opponent thus far. Yeah, this re reigning level has really shown up. Yeah, they're not messing around. Okay, now I'm better developed than him. I would like to break open the position, but we need a pawn break to do that unless I'm going to sacrifice on g5. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this knight back here, and then I'm going to go for f4 and look to try to swap pawns on g5. His king is still in the center, and he's not going to seek shelter on the king side, I'll tell you that. So he's probably going to end up having to go long in order to protect himself. So the, the, the time is ripe to open this up. He's kind of wasted some time in playing this whole knight d7 to b6 takes a4, or into a4, queen takes a5 operation. And if we want to prove compensation for the pawn, we have to be ready to open the position. 
So that's what I'm trying to do right now. All right, he plays f5, so he's beating me to the punch a little bit. That is a good move, actually. So if I take Ampassant, he's going to take with his knight, is what he's saying. Good move from my opponent. Okay, well, I'm still going to take and open it up. And after knight takes, probably queen g3. He does have knight e4 then. Uh, but I think I, I still need to open lines and try to get some play going. Knight e4, queen e3 probably. Defending the bishop and also the pawn on c3. He takes, okay. So he gets rid of the dark square bishop. I am still down a pawn, but maybe I can sneak my knight up into the game, like knight g4, and try to come to the e5 square. That's a really nice outpost square, if I'm able to get my knight there. Here he could castle kingside. Before it was a little risky, but uh, now that the, the landscape has changed a little bit, he might be willing to do that. I'll still play knight g4, though. That's my immediate next move, more than likely. So let's do that. If he goes queen f4 looking for a queen trade, I can win a piece. And if you want to ask yourself how that's possible, you can pause your video and try to figure it out. So if black plays queen f4, how does white win a piece? Well, I thought the answer was uh, queen f4, queen takes e f4, uh, g takes f4, knight f6 check, and then take his bishop on the next move. However, after knight f6 check, king e7, knight takes d7, removing the defender of the knight, he does have the in-between move, knight takes c3, in fact, attacking my bishop on e2. <laughs> so maybe I wouldn't win a piece in that line. So queen f4 might be, might be a possibility. Hmm, I wonder if he calculated all that. So queen takes f4, pawn takes f4, knight check, king e7, knight takes d7. He does have knight takes c3. And attacking the bishop, and my knight would be hanging. Hmm. So in that case, maybe I shouldn't trade queens. Yeah, let's just drop our queen back. If he calculated that, very good on you, Santiago Magno. Good job. I could trade queens and then try to like set up that threat by playing a move like rook a3, but that gives him a chance to move the knight back. So I want to play a little more directly right now. Not happy about having to put my queen on the back rank, but I think it's okay. Knight b2. Mm, I don't know about that move. The knight seems vulnerable down on that square. Because where is it going? It doesn't really have a whole lot of follow-up squares to go to. All right, I'll just play knight e5, taking a look at his bishop on d7. Oh, I'm also threatening knight g6, by the way, forking the queen and the rook. Mm, moves the knight right back to a4. Okay, so he was playing very well up to this point, but uh, now he's going to lose material. And to keep this as simple as possible, I'm going to take his bishop and then take on a4. I could have also gone uh, knight g6, but he would have had queen f6 defending the rook with his queen. But I didn't want to do that. Rook takes a4, and yeah, we're just up a piece right now. Okay, let's play rook a6. Get out of the attack. His king is also pretty exposed, too. We got to get these guys untangled, but once we do that, we should be winning without any major issues. He's pretty low on time as well. Queen c7. Okay, so now, what's a good move for white that would apply a lot of pressure to a weak point in black's position? All right, the answer is bishop g4. So now we're hitting e6 three times. By playing bishop g4, we add the bishop and the queen as an attacker on that point. Okay, let's come in with our queen. Now rook d6 check is a big threat. The pawn on d5 is also hanging.
Okay. Yeah, and he resigned. Um, very well played by my opponent, though, in the opening. Um, I think this is all theory, but um, playing c4 is not quite correct. But then again, I don't know that I can like punish this move necessarily. I think I honestly misplayed it a little bit because he seemed to get a good position. Um, it's a little hard here. Like For video purposes, I'm trying to make the uh, explanations in my play as simple as possible. But it is possible that in uh, at a higher level, it may be better, or not even at a higher level, just objectively, it may be better for white to uh, play more aggressively against a line like this. Like, for instance, I mentioned the possibility of h4 here. Possibly that's a move I should just play right away and try to get my pawn up to h5 and try to start uh, breaking down his pawn structure. I'm a little hesitant to make such moves when I'm trying to keep the video um, pretty, pretty much instructive and... I don't want to just be moving rook pawns. <laughs> Already I would have moved two rook pawns and people might be asking, why are you moving rook pawns right away? Didn't you say like a couple videos ago you shouldn't do that? Um, but I think it kind of highlights the fact that in chess, you always have to be thinking um, uh, what as to what the position demands. And you can only follow like general rules um, in positions where those general rules will work, right? So you should always be willing to override rules in, in the case that uh, you think it's acceptable to do so and the position demands it. So it's possible that h4 was simply correct here. So after knight f3, h6, he was making a lot of pawn moves, but then again, I ended up uh, losing my a4 pawn. I think I had some compensation for it, but uh, he played well. A lot of these moves are pretty time consuming though. And once I was able to play f4, or once I had in mind the idea f4, black had to respond pretty actively. But he did that though, f5 was a good move. E takes f6 on passant, knight takes f6, queen g3, knight e4, here, tick, tick. I think all these moves are great. Knight g4, and yeah, queen f4. Um, I don't know if he calculated this, but after queen takes, pawn takes, I did have knight f6 check. However, after king e7 take, I thought I was winning a piece initially, but he does have this move, counterattacking my bishop, and the knight is hanging. So I may not be winning a piece in this line. Okay, so I think there was a clear difference in uh, the strength of play in these opponents and games that we got under our belt here at the uh, 1200 to 1400 level versus 1000 to 1200. Uh, a lot of the same concepts apply, like playing classical chess and uh, making sure you're keeping track of your undefended pieces. Uh, but you can see that this level of play uh, is of a higher caliber and it demands greater and greater accuracy. Uh, like I said, I think it makes sense to spend a little more time on your openings at this level, start introducing some opening play, and uh, also taking a very critical look at your games. So reviewing your games as much as you can and trying to discern how these slightly higher rated players are outplaying you, if they are outplaying you. So thank you guys for watching. Uh, I'll be back with another installment of uh, Climbing the Rating Ladder very soon, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.